HiSec buyback offers 90% GDA anywhere in HiSec. Simply go to HiSec.EveBuyback.com, appraise your items, create a contract, and get paid quickly. Hi everyone, I'm Rain and welcome back to Talking in Stations. This week we're going to talk about a handful of things with our guests Asherathi and Elby. We also have Artemis in the background running the show, but don't worry if you can't hear him. He's deliberately on mute. So if you hear us kind of responding to the void, that's probably because we're talking to him. And so to kick us off, we're going to go through the new patch that came out this week, as well as the Hunt live event that's going on right now. I know Ashtarathi has been passionately following some of these updates, so I'm going to let him like take us away. I think, Ash, I know you've been wanting to talk about, what is it, the new Redeem queue, I think is what you've I've seen you say in Twitch chat a lot. The login rewards? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, the login rewards are really cool. Actually, there we got some more news on that just today. So let me take a step back. So we had what's known as the Evergreen reward system now for a couple of years. Basically, you know, like when you have an event, then there can be a track and every day you log in, you get some stuff. But then there's just like this every day when you log in, you might get like a really crappy BPC or a temporary skin or a small booster or something like that but nobody ever really cared about it. And so now they've really, they've revamped it and made sure that each of the bonuses or each of the things that you get are actually kind of useful. So instead of temporary skins, you now get permanent skins. And we'll get back to that in a second, but you also, there's also new boosters that you can get that are extremely powerful. And you can still get the, the filaments and some of the other stuff, but there's no more BPCs and there's no more temporary skins. As far as the skins go, there's a new skin line known as the Halcyon Dawn skin line, which is the same as the biosecurity skins, but rather than blue, it's a gold, but it's the same pattern, same projection. You know, it's just a recolor. However, that is not the only kind of skin that you can get. Uh, you can get other previous skins that are no longer available, no longer drop, no longer were part of older events. But just like the uh, Halcyon Dawn and the other skins, these apply upon redemption. So you can't like trade it on the auction or on the market or anything like that. That said, we have confirmed both Purity the Throne skins dropping or being given out. And just this morning on Reddit, somebody was confirmed that they got an Icky Tursa All Stars Casino Clash skin which up until now required you to be at Eve Vegas in 2019 in order to have. So you can get some very, very rare and awesome and, and valuable skins through this system. That's interesting. I didn't know that they were actually giving out those more exclusive skins because I know in the past, so like there are some skins I think CCP has said like they'll never give out. And I always thought the event skins, like those uh, live event skins were one of them. The other being Alliance tournament skins. So if you... Like, if right. you won an Alliance tournament and got a skin, then they wouldn't give those out again. CCP Swift confirmed that this is an extremely rare thing to get, and that it doesn't, it doesn't get redeemed as an item, so it can't, like, affect the market, which I think is the big difference, right? Like, yeah. they're never going to give out the skin license again, but you can get the skin through the login reward. Now, what's interesting about this is that it specifically doesn't, it attempts to not give you duplicates. So in theory, over time, you would collect all, you know, 250 plus skins available to you. So even the rare ones would become more common. But obviously, we're going to have to see how that plays out over time. Yeah, I do know. So I've been doing the redeem, I think, every day since Tuesday. And I've only gotten two skins. So like five days, two skins. But like if you think of the fact that the Halcyon skins, it's like 200 to 300 because I think it's one for every ship. It's going to be it's like 250, 240 something, 246, I think. Or, yeah, um, it's like yeah. quite a long time before we start running out of skins and you're starting to get right. to only the rare ones. Yeah, exactly. And, you know, as you pointed out, like if you if today's a booster day, then you're not getting a skin, right? Like so it's only like a third or a fourth of the time even that you would even have any skin at all. So it'll it's interesting. Also, there are different levels of boxes. You know, there's like a common, uncommon, rare, and epic or whatever. Oh, okay. So I assume that those super rare ones will mostly only be found. So it has to be a skin. It probably has to be an epic box. And then you have a chance at it. You know, that would be incredibly rare. 
Nice. Okay. That actually, that explains, I was going to ask why the login colors were different and that actually makes a lot more sense now that you say that. Yeah. The boosters, there are four new kinds of boosters, each based on a color, the four colors of the races and their boosts are applied to the, and like are generally speaking associated with those races, but they are like each booster I think has like five or six different things that it buffs. I've made a cheat sheet that breaks them all down, but you know everything from combat capabilities to mining laser distance range and and speed to hacking skills. So basically, no matter what you do, these bonus you know these boosters might be very useful to you. Uh, and I say might though because the key here is is that once again these can't be made into an item. They can't be traded. You know whatever. So you have to have it in your redemption queue in order to use it, which I think is really good. It 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 makes a new player makes a player like try to work around the bo- the buff. Like if you see if you get a really strong blue buff, then maybe you might want to consider doing something crazy with a with a Kaldari ship or you know utilize those bonuses in some way for a couple of hours. But at the same time, it's not like this is going to vastly influence fleet warfare. Because you can't reliably ensure that everyone, or even a notable percentage of your force, has one of these buffs readily available. You know what I mean? Yeah, for sure. I have heard people say that they're almost too overpowered, but at the same time, it only lasts... So it's only in your queue for seven days, and then it lasts, I think, a max of four hours. So that's a... You're like largely gambling on having it, you know, just ready to go whenever you're trying to do something, like in PvP. Right, they are incredibly strong, but they require you to work with them, not the other way around, right? Like, you get one and you go, okay, well, how am I going to use this? Rather than, I'm going to do this, let me get the the drug to help me, you know? Yeah, Which exactly. I think is actually good, because it, it encourages people to mix things up a little bit. Yeah, it should be fun. I'm one of those people where I just keep them in, I don't think I've ever really redeemed them to use them. But now that they're actually kind of useful, I might just keep them there and then panic redeem them when the, in like fleet combat, even if it may not help me. <laughs> yeah, and they, I mean, there are general, so, I mean, obviously like a shield boost won't help you with, with armor, but they, it, everybody should be able to find something to use for them. And they are kind of different, like one of them has a relic boost, one of them has a data boost, one of them has scan strength and speed, etc. It is kind of hard to keep track because that, so that's why we made a the cheat sheet. But overall, they are incredibly powerful if if you can utilize their power. Yeah, for sure. And then, do we want to transition to the hunt? Then I know I feel like that's what a lot of people are kind of excited for. I've seen lots of talk on Twitter and and then my discords about it, like trying to theory craft. Yeah, the hunt returns. The hunt is. The Easter event, it is hosted by the Garistas. It focuses on T2, Destroyer, and Down. So there are, we're going to call it five different sites, five asterisk different sites. There are the easier sites, which are just the hunt sites, which can be found anywhere. And then there's the hunt master sites that are the harder sites. There's a hunt and a hunt master, both for combat and data sites. So there's a hunt master and a hunt data site. There's a hunt master and a hunt combat site. In addition to that, there is a capital shipyard that that requires heavy equipment, probably capitals, to run. However, there's a caveat with this one, which is that in order to get into any of these kinds of sites, there's a gate at some point, but usually like but the combat one, it's the inner gate. Like there's two different rooms and the gate from the first room to the second room is the one that requires the key. But there, you know, you do need a key to get into each of these, like where the prizes are. And those keys are discovered by finding mysterious capsules, which can be anywhere in New Eden. They can be at any planet, any moon, stargate, or asteroid belt. And they warp around and stuff. So you look for them with your D-scan, you zero down on them, and then uh, you pop them and you get one of these hunt keys. 
There's also extremely rare golden pods, which have, from my understanding, somewhere between 150 to 300 million s worth of stuff in them just by the, by themselves. So they're they're like jackpots. I've I've seen one, and I know somebody who's been actively hunting them that have gotten three. So either way, once you have the keys, you've got the easier sites and the harder sites. The easier sites can be found anywhere, and the harder Huntmaster sites and the Capital Shipyard can only be found in Kaldari, Losek, and Venal. Okay, so most of Kaldari Losek is, of course, within the Galente Kaldari War Zone. It does not matter who owns the system at the moment, like for War Zone control. It just matters who originally, you know, owned that system. So, you know, Black Rise or Placid or whatever. Or, no, Placid's Galente, I think. Either way. So in those areas, you can see you can find both Huntmaster and Hunt sites. The combat sites are a little bit more tricky than they were before, from my understanding. I haven't done very many of the combat sites this year. But the, uh, the fighter that used to be the old boss, from my understanding, is actually in now the combat room. So that you go in, there's a gate that anybody can go through. And then there's a room where you fight some rats. And then there's another gate that you use the, hunt, the, the key for. And then that brings you into an inner room where there is a jackdaw and some towers. And you kill the jackdaw and that's where your prize is. So, you know, you can have your squad of people that help you clear the room, but every single person that wants to go into that inner room would have to use one of these keys. So usually we would clear the outer room and then send like one person in to go finish the hunt, the, the boss. So now, if, if those are the PVE sites, do the data sites have the same thing where you have to fight rats or is that only like hacking? They're only hacking, but... Interestingly enough, they still have the destroyer down requirement. So you can't bring a Stratios. Oh, you can't get okay. in with a T3 cruiser or anything like that. It's only like exploration ship uh, frigates and stuff like that. Now, the Huntmaster data sites, man, I want to I want to gush about these. These are brand new this year and it is by I've been doing exploration my whole my whole career in Eve. These are by far the most fun data sites I have ever worked with. And they're very, very simple. So the way it works is when you first show up, there are four cans around the outside or, you know, around the room and a gate in the middle. And the four cans are all red hack cans. So some of the hardest cans in the game. And there's this giant like snaking rock all through that area. So you have to pilot around the rock to get to the four cans. And remember, you're exposed right now, right? Like anybody could just warp in and be right there on grid with you. So there's four cans that have the red hack, and then you can use the key to get on the inside. Once you're on the inside, there's actually five more cans with some stuff that you have to fly around. But these are sleeper difficulty hard, you know, so 120 coherence, 90 coherence, sorry, 120 coherence core, 90 coherence regeneration node, like hardest, hardest sites that you could possibly get. So but there's five of them. The rewards are extremely good. And what I like is that like you can be greedy and get the ones on the outside that aren't that technically aren't worth as much but are still good. Or you can just, you know, give up or you can play it safe and get on the inside, which is way harder to, you know, catch you in because you should be able to see them on the gate and they need a key in order to get in and all that stuff. So, there's kind of like different levels of danger and different levels of reward that I really, really like. Nice. That's really interesting. Do you have to combat or probe the data sites down or are they just on the... the nope, they are level four data sites. You have to probe okay. them down. The, uh, the combat sites are not, they're just there. And then the final fifth site, I spent a day hunting around Venal. Haven't been able to find it. Apparently there's a new landmark like site called the viper pit that moves around venal i'm not sure if there's anything like special about it necessarily it's their new shipyard but they've been starting to put these landmarks into the game that only last for the event so i've been i've been trying to find it <laughs> making a lot of money on the way but not finding it 
What's the Viper pit supposed to hold? Besides, I don't obviously know. Vipers. It's it's the it's their it's their major shipyard, and it it just says that it moves around, and the uh, descriptions like the what CCP has said that it is a, it's defended. Like I don't know if there's any prizes there or anything to find there besides just a landmark, unknown. Fun. Sorry, my uh, cat is screaming at me. So that so all of this can be done by new players, correct? I'm guessing the harder sites probably can't be done by new players, but the easier ones can. Yeah, I'd probably say so, especially. Like the combat sites, I still, as always, recommend a group. Even two people will find it significantly more manageable than one, just because you can split the aggro and all that kind of stuff. But yeah, I mean, the normal hunt sites should be able to be done by relatively new players, whereas the hunt master sites are, you know, a pretty good challenge. The a if I remember correctly, when I went, I did go to a hunt data site at one point, and the cans were significantly easier than the hunt master ones. So I imagine that a new player could do those as well. The uh, the rewards are things like overseer effects, Garissa implants, so like Hydras and Valimars and stuff like that, the uh, acceleration boosters, and uh, some skins and gecko BPCs. Oh, nice, more geckos. Yep. I didn't realize that. And then the the overseer effects. Those are the items that you have to carry and sell to NPCs, right? Right. They they're just a commodity. A Concord buys them, so you just take them there and sell them to the NPC buy orders. Nice. So at least you get guaranteed as whereas the other stuff, the market can fluctuate. Right. Yep. Uh, yes, there's the naughty people and the ace pod hunters. Thank goodness. It wouldn't be an event if we didn't have fireworks. Is Absolutely. It, is it really called naughty people fireworks? Yeah. That's that's what the Gristas are associated with. Uh, I can't remember why the name naughty people come up, but like the the phrase naughty people and, and Gristas are tied together. Okay. I feel like that's CCP's way of adding in a little risque stuff while making it lore related so they don't get in trouble. And I'm watching this video that Artemis is showing. It's looking like finding the... I actually really like this. So it looks like you can probe down... You don't have... Not probe. I shouldn't say that. But you can descan down the, the random capsules. And I really like that because I think all other events either require probes or just your just the probe window where you can find the sites on the window. Whereas this one actually kind of teaches you how to use a descan if you don't know how yet. Yeah, CCB Aurora put up a really good video on the mark on this, and and people have said this every year for the Garistas that it, I hear it all the time that people credit this event for when they got good at descanning, you know, because it's one of those things. It's like, you know, you might know you might know how to do it, but this this forces you to do it over and over and over again, and you may think that you know how to do these kinds of basic things, but until you actually like practice it for a long period of time, you're not going to be able to polish those little, you know, refinements of getting really good at it. Like you can know how to descan, but there's a difference between that and being able to be quick and effective with it, you know? Yeah, for sure. And I think this um, is good too, because I know when I've always practiced, it's always been in actual combat situations. So this one's right. nice because you can do it yourself. There's no pressure. You just fly around and try to learn. Yep, exactly. And I think this is really important for like game design because it's like it's not about necessarily challenging the person. It's about like giving them a, a task that they can do. But then over time, as you're doing it, you're going to get more unsatisfied with with your inefficiencies. And so you're going to be motivated to, you know, figure out how to do it even better over time once you've gotten the hang of it. And by the way, I just looked it up. Garistus, the word Garistus in Kaldari means naughty people. That's where, the, oh. that's where the phrase comes from. Okay, that makes sense then. Ash, you said you made a bunch of money looking for this Viper Pit site. Can you give us a conservative estimate of how much money you've made so far in this event? Uh, I made about $700 million in that pass through. So roughly $100 million an hour, assuming that things sell the way that they, they should, 
one of the implants says that it's worth like 300, but I don't, I mean, obviously the problem is that these kinds of events tends to crash those markets. But I've gotten anywhere from like 150 to 300 mil million in a single Huntmaster site, a data site, when I'm lucky, and like 50 million when I'm not. Because I've gotten, you know, you get a gecko PPC, that's like almost 100 million right there. Yeah, I would say 50 mil is like not bad either, because I know, I mean, it's better than if you were going out and rent. Incredible. Yeah, like that's that's <laughs> really good normally. Or like even if you're doing combat sites, like I know, I mean, I've done ratting in nullsec, right? And it's like, it's like what? Maybe like just either above or below that. But I mean, for this stuff, it would have been super simple. Sorry, my cat says hello. That that said, those those harder sites with the big rewards, it isn't just about how harder the site is. Remember, you have been all of these people are concentrated into a couple of regions in low sec and one region in null sec, right? So it it's pretty wild how much stuff is going on out there. I stumbled upon golems and and marshals trying to run capital sites and dreads and when I went to venal I I stumbled upon fraternity blowing up an astrohus like, you know, it's it it the major danger isn't necessarily the sites themselves. So have you had any PvP then? Like, have people come to try and gank you in your site, or you've, like, stumbled across somebody running a site that you've stolen from? I have been pretty... I'm, I'm in a pretty nice pacifier, so I've been doing a pretty good job of avoiding such things. But I have stumbled upon... I got to a Huntmaster site, and there was one can hacked in an Estero wreck, and I was like, oh, okay. That doesn't seem worth it. I do know. I've seen. I've seen on Twitter. CCP Kestrel says he's been running these sites in like a hawk, and he posted his fit. Obviously, a bit blingy, so nothing for a newer player or poorer player. But he says he's been actually like actively combating, like going one v two to try and you know defend his sites, not only against other players, but then also trying to tank it along with the rats. So like he like yeah. having the he rat aggro switch and stuff. Historically, like this is the event that I've done the most when it comes to like roaming around with a little gang and like doing PvPVE. I mean, I I think I even did it with a CCB dev like a year or two ago. But the whole point is is that like the sites first of all you're in a, like a frigate or a destroyer. So especially if you're in a small team, your commitment to the field is not high, but you know, the rats themselves are fight a lot like players and they scram and they have other e war and stuff. And so you got to be prepared for it. You can always stumble upon people that are, you know, in the middle of the fight and they're already engaged, they're scrammed or whatever, so they can't necessarily leave. But then once you get in, there's no telling who the rats are going to go after. So it's kind of this dynamic, chaotic battle, which can be fun. Yeah, for sure. It really teaches you how to like adapt and, and whatnot as well. So I yeah. think... Is there anything else, Ash, you want to talk about related to the hunt? I think we've covered all the big topics. There are some skins that are that are like in the in the store and all that stuff, but the Ace of Power Hunter skins, I'm not the biggest fan of them, but they are available if you're interested. Yeah, those are items players can either wait till someone buys and puts on the market, or they can buy it themselves with Plex, or I guess I'm wondering if you could probably buy it with real life dollars to then redeem to your character, but I'm guessing it's just Plex on the NES store. I think so. There are Hunter packs available for cash. Let me pull that up real quick uh, and see what they are. I try not to pay that much attention to those because, quite frankly, I, I'm I'm not a big fan of skins that are provided through packs only. But oh yeah, I see what you're saying. We also got a question in chat. So why is the Gecko such a great drone? We're talking about how one of those is like the BPC. One of the reasons is you can't get it in any other way through the game. You have to do it through these events or wait for CCP to give it out. It's a medium drone. It has omni damage, speed, tracking, and tank. A and heavy then drone. It's a heavy? Okay. Yep. I, th I thought so, it was a medium. So the advantage of the Gecko is that it's a super heavy. So it's a single heavy drone with 50 bandwidth that is a little bit stronger than ha having two other heavy drones, mostly because it's a little bit faster than a normal heavy drone. 
Okay, I see. There is a, there's a subverted there's a subverted JVN drone that is the medium version, but it's not nearly as popular. That's what I was thinking of. Okay. The the real big thing is that a rattlesnake with a gecko on it is just <laughs> devastating. They have a single drone that's just this like it's it's like a destroyer. <laughs> Yeah, so Gecko's super strong, and then the fact that you can't really get them in any other way means, like, once they die, they're gone, and you have to wait, so the price almost always goes up, so a lot of people will invest with them, or they just use them because they're really super overpowered. Yeah, you can only get them during this event. Yeah, there are Ace of Pod Hunter skins that are part of the, the package, so, like, the okay. $25 pack comes with all four Destroyers Pod Hunter skins, for example. Okay, so there there is that if folks want to do that. I mean, if they don't have the Plex, which I think with that pack, oh, you don't get Plex. It also comes with 500 Plex, so yeah. Oh, it does, okay. So yeah, people can do that if that's sort of their forte. Yep, and there's also like new outfits and stuff. They're, what, they did add a new like Bane mask, but that does not appear to be part of this event. So I'm I'm watching closely to see where that's going to be made available. Because it is like the, a, an orange, which is a, the the color of of this event in Garistas. So, but so far, I don't think anybody's seen it. But they have seen the new duds, the new pod hunter clothing and stuff. Okay, that makes sense. But yes, those those rare clothing drops. I know CCB has done that with a lot of events in the past. The other thing too is I don't know if people realize. So like, Garistas has the rabbit like kind of theme. And it's Easter, so the pot, the capsules being Easter eggs. That's kind of the theme CCP was going for, which was kind of hilarious because otherwise I think around this time there may not really be sort of a celebration. But that's yeah, I think um, that's the overall theme CCP is going for. So back in 2015, when uh, the Crimson Harvest were f was first released, it was Eve Vegas, and I was there, and we were at like this lore panel, and they're talking about Crimson Harvest and and the events and all that stuff. And I remember raising my hand. And asking, well, when are we going to get the Garistus bunny? And everybody laughed at me. But here we are. That said, one thing I do really like about this event is that they, just like with the previous event that they did with the Guardians Gala and the stealing of the ore technology and all that stuff, they worked in kind of plot into a regular event. They did the same thing here again. So... There, is, there basically was an operation where the Garistas were in G to 44 and they were attempting to steal information or get information that you can get if you destroy the golden pods. You can get these logs, which break down or they have like the trend, the communications of this dude. And the thing I love about it is at the on the final one, they said they say you know like get out of here, activate contingency omelet. Everyone hide until the egg farm is safe. So, and then uh, the morning of, there actually, like, there really was, if you were at Jita at downtime at the beginning of this event, you would have seen hundreds of pods warping away from And there's footage of it. They made a scope video of it and all that stuff. But the idea is, is that the Garistas have now stolen the, the technology that will release that is the blueprint changes for, ba for capitals and faction ships that's about to come. So that information is now stolen. We're now punishing the Grisses for it. And at the end of this event, we will get the technology that they've stolen. Nice. Now, that, that's a really good way for CCP to incorporate things, at least to make it look like instead of the live events team kind of operating on their own in a silo with lore that people may or may not care about, to actually like incorporate it into everything. So like the whole universe makes sense and kind of building up for FanFest when they're talking about all these updates. Absolutely. And it also helps kind of reflect the different organizations and, and give us a better lens into all these different characters, right? Because like the way that the Garistas do an operation is significantly different than the way that the Serpentis or the Angels do, you know? Speaking of that, I really wish CCP gave us the option to kind of team up with the with the pirates. Like I know my character has positive standing to Diamond Rats of Garistas. So why like, why do I have to go out? If I want rewards, why do I have to go out and kill Garistas rather than why not help them and then get you know, the rewards or whatever, the points to get right. the rewards? 
And there like, are some events that have been doing this. Crimson Harvest, for example, used to only be against the Blood Raiders, but now you can either go after the Blood Raiders or you can go after the Order of St. Tetramon, which is the Amar side of things. So you can theoretically, quote unquote, work for the for the Blood Raiders. In fact, that's the one where you turn in the corpses to the Blood Raiders that you collect from the Amar side of the sites. Yeah. So there have been like some of that choose your side sort of thing, but that's also a relatively new tech. You know, we saw the the Liberation Games last year where you could choose a side. And yeah. Then, and then the Crimson Harvest was the next one. So we'll see if they can experiment with that more later or as time goes on. I know that that's like an interest, but I was I was actually suspecting that there would be some of that where you could actually disrupt, you know, you could kick Kaldari while they're down with all this Garistus chaos going on, but it does not appear to be the case. Yeah, maybe maybe that's when they're finally done like revamping things because I know they're still revamping a lot of stuff kind of in the background. Yeah, it does. I mean, like the other thing is is that I I have to remind people that we're less than a month from FanFest, so they're not gonna like bust out their big poppers right now, right? Like they if they have something big, yeah. they they'll want to talk about it there, and it's very clear that they are ramping towards just outright conflict war war is coming as i as i've been saying so we'll have to see because i think that there's going to be a lot of like choosing your side and who you want to necessarily push for yeah for sure all righty i know that the hunts was only a small part of the these patch notes do we want to progress to some of the other updates can i ask one more question yeah i just want to confirm the sites are located everywhere right i don't have to go to caldari losec or Vino. I, I can find them. these standard hunt necessary. sites are available everywhere in fact i okay i've heard of people finding pods in pochvin for example so right so i don't uh, have to travel across the universe to find the sites Correct. i can do them where i live just the right. good ones are in Vino and caldari losec yep and of course cool. the ones in high sec you know you're gonna have to deal with com competition that you can't necessarily kill and all that sort of confusion, but you know that's just a normal event thing. The I I would imagine that that running the if you want to finish the track, there is a reward track with some skins and some boosters and stuff. If you just want to finish the tra track, I think just grinding the normal easier hunt sites should probably be the the way to do it. And then the way to like find your fortune is to go do the hunt master sites yeah that would make sense and i figure if there's rare drops obviously they're going to show up in the uh, the harder sites right and from the golden pods oh yeah that too yeah any other questions or comments from you ash not that i can think of not about the hunt let me pull up the patch notes just so i make sure that we don't miss anything yeah so the patch notes, I'm kind of excited because they have the Roracle Conduit jump. And I really, I kind of want to see people use that, but I don't know if I would ever use it myself because I don't really fly my Roracle. And, and actually, yeah, I do fly it in combat, so I guess there's that. Yeah, the Battle Roracles, the yeah, Battle Procures. So they have, so what they did was they added the ability for the industrial jump portal generator module, which is new. So people are building that and it allows Roracles to both bridge and jump. So jumping similar to capitals, the Roracle is a capital and it can jump, but this is a conduit jump. So what it can do is it can take itself plus uh, up to 30 passengers. So I'm guessing 30 other. But yeah, it so uh, a couple of years ago, like the Blops ship have always been able to jump into covert ops Sinos, right? And the blob ship can turn into a bridge, much like a Titan can. But only covert ops capable ships can be bridged with, through through the black ops ship. Just like they can, yeah, either way. But then they added in, in I think 2019, the conduit jump for black ops, where now the black ops battleship, rather than opening up a bridge and letting people through, can jump itself and bring a bunch of people with it, which ends up being way more efficient for fuel, but of course commits the Black Ops to the battlefield. So what they've done is they've basically done that exact same thing, but for mining ships. So now 
the rogue wall can either become a bridge for mining ships in the porpoise to go through just to jump directly to the site or you know the destination or the rogue wall can do a conduit jump where they take as you said 30 or uh mining ships or the porpoise and bring them through with it so that way you can like ninja mine or i don't know hot drop with 30 skiffs or whatever Whatever suits your fancy, I suppose. Yeah. So mining exhumers, barges, mining frigates, and porpoise. So no no orca. I know that question was asked in chat. But it's also really funny, too, because like, you can use it to escape, I'm assuming. So if you're out there mining an asteroid belt and you see a bunch of bad baddies like, burning in at you, instead of trying to panic or warp away, you just like right-click jump. Like I know, especially if you're in like a home system, there's a, a lot of places have... Like beacons, like Sino beacons, you can jump to, so you don't have to worry about an exit Sino. But it can both be used defensively yeah, and offensively. I can't wait for somebody to do that, and like, because like mining fleets might spread out a little bit, so the Rokwall panic jumps out and leaves like a dozen or so mining ships behind. Like, okay, yeah. wait for me. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it doesn't. We'll it doesn't say the range, but I'm guessing there is a range. It's not just going to be like if you're on grid in a mining ship, you get included. So. It'll be What's the range for a regular a regular bridge? Like a regular bridge is twenty five hundred meters, yep, right? Twenty five hundred. I think the. But I think so I the, like the conduit filaments when you yeet or something like that. I think like, it's six k. Yeah, six. six? So, yeah. yeah. I think it's six. I know for the MJDs it's it six. Conduit jumps are within ten kilometers, at least for the Black Ops. Yeah. So it's probably ten then. And we, we talked about the porpoise being in with it, right? Yep, I got distracted. I there was a white there, capsule but... in my system, so I had to go get it. <laughs> so basically, originally it was only going to be mining ships. And then uh, Dunk Dinkle was like, it should have the porpoise, and just kept on championing that. And CCP relented, and now the porpoise is, is one of the things that can go with the, with the conduit portal. So Dunk Dinkle wins again. Yes. CCP listening to feedback, yes. He, he got a notch on his belt. But I did, too. I got a notch this patch, too, with the Proteus. Because when they announced the Proteus buff, I started becoming very loud about the fact that I was very sad that there would be a Proteus buff without including uh, a new buff to the drone subsystem. And lo and behold, on top of the announced Proteus buffs of the mass reduction of plates for the sub one subsystem and the hybrid, the increased power grid for the hybrid subsystem, they now have actually increased the bandwidth of the oh. You cut out there. Uh -oh. Ash. Uh oh. All right. I think yeah. So Artemis is showing this on stream. So this was the update. So I know CC. Hi. Are... Welcome back. Oh, Sorry about that. My headset died. <laughs> Yeah, so CCP Aurora had been talking. I think this was actually part of her changes and updates. So she had been like talking and discussing with players this. So Ash's comments around adding the drone stuff was, with the handshake there showing it was collaborative was fairly accurate. Yeah, I, and it's really cool too. So like basically they increased the bandwidth so that way you can have a full flight of heavy drones, yeah. which makes the Proteus a much uh, the the drone Proteus a much more viable concept. Which I feel has been a missing piece to all this. They, the the Proteus, as long as I've been playing this game, has had a drone subsystem, but I've never seen like a practical use for drone Proteus. So hope springs eternal, I guess. Yeah, for I sure. I think we have to give CCP Mirage some credit here too, because he's been tweeting about the Proteus for a while and his adventures in wormholes. So maybe he brought. Yep. Some. Light he's actually one of the, the guys uh, I was mostly talking to about the the drone yeah, thing because yeah. I know he loves it. So this is actually really interesting. The uh, the scope videos and stuff, like it it's shown him running, or, you know, a Proteus running sleeper sites and stuff. Like he goes out and actually runs all of these sites. He tweets them, you know, his results online and all that stuff. But he's out there doing these things live to get footage. It's it's pretty cool. Nice. I actually really like that now too. Where. CCP doesn't have to, like that change was it last year or a couple of years ago where they don't have to hide their in-game characters anymore where they can actually do things. I think it's been super helpful for the game. Just some um, 
just like with CCP being able to like, you know, stream themselves doing stuff, playing with character or playing with friends. They don't have to be on the CCP account. And then also the fact that they're able to like actually be vocal, like when joining groups or doing things out in space. It's a it's way yeah, easier. It for really just dispel- Sorry. Go on. It really dispels that myth that like, oh, CCP doesn't play their own game. It's like you can you can see them out there. Yeah, for sure. Especially like, and the fact that they don't have to use CCP accounts, because I know like CCP accounts are just like GM accounts, right? Like you can do so much on them. So like trying to use those with normal casual play is pretty difficult. So the fact that they can just like, like use their old normal characters or, you know, new characters that they built is super simple. There's also a lot of bullshit, honestly, with when it comes to your account, because like their, their pre, their official accounts or whatever. Because there's the whole thing about, like, they can't actually add real value into the game necessarily through yeah. their dev hacks. And so there has to be this, like, really solid firewall. You know, every single time I've talked to, I've done, like, a, a collaborative with CCP, that's one of the things that they've been really focused on is, like, pointing out what, it, what they have and haven't, like, provided for themselves via their ability. So having their own account that's, like, quote-unquote legal, you know, street legal... I think it's really effective. Yeah, I remember. I mean, you know this too. Like when we do events with CCP, like I think the first time we did the Proving Grounds events, like I when I set up ships, I was like, oh, if they're going to be on their CCP accounts, I might need to provide the ship. And I think that was even one of the comments. They're like, well, they're like we can provide a ship as long as you don't like officer bling fit it because we're not going to just spawn officer fits into the game or whatever. So I just I did like a simple T2 ship or whatever. And I remember I... I had a bunch of fits for CCP Rise, who was flying with me, and other stuff like that. It's a lot of consideration, you know, as a player that we probably don't really think about. Yeah, they they really do put a lot of concern into those kinds of things. But that actually reminds me that the the proving they've been doing these proving conduits, and they're getting better, man. Like they're, you know. It, it used to be very much that there's a lot of like collaboration and other, you know, like the, it just kind of there, a lot of the times it just didn't work out, but more and more, I feel like these events have, or the proving conduits have been really good at like getting people engaged, everything from like, Hey, it's Corvettes. So who gives a shit? Just go do it all the way up to like the next couple of events are going to be a strategic cruisers and something else. So the battleship brawls have always been, has been really proper, popular recently. The Abyss the abyss events have been, or the Abyss Proving Conduits have been really fun. Yeah, I think the last one was for April Fools, and it was, like, peak chaos. And, like, yes. everyone I've talked to, like, you, like when you read it, you're like, this makes no sense, what do I do? And then, like, everyone who's done it was like, oh my god, this is the best conduit event ever. The part that I loved about it, honestly, was that it, not only does it give you a random buff, but it didn't tell you Right. There is no charm that like you could hover over to say what's affecting you. Like you have to literally just look at your ship stats and try to figure out which buff is currently applied to everybody within the room. Which led some to some pretty interesting event, you know, circumstances. Yeah, it was it was pretty fun. All right. So we talked Oracle. We talked Proteus. There's structure balance changes. I don't know if I reviewed those. Yeah. This is a big one. So oh, okay, yeah. Cool. Structure, structures got pretty significantly nerfed in their combat capability. Mostly, like all of the things that apply to like capitals have had their ability, their damage, like nerfed by almost half. I think they 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 have added the new ammo for the point defense systems. But that, the requirement to use the ammo, I don't think it's coming in until at least the 19th. But that will have a minute-long reload time, so it'll open up these windows of opportunity where the PDS can't be fired. Likewise, the bomb deployers have gone, you know, bomb launchers have gone from like 10 bombs per launch or per, per loadout to four. And so you're going to have to reload significantly more often. And also the the Vortron projector, their doomsday, can no longer be used on subcapitals. So it's a strictly capital anti-capital weapon. 
I'm kind of sad about that because I always loved watching fleets get doomsdayed by Keepstar. It was just I mean, so much. Mean still channel, fun. just be capitals. <laughs> no, I mean like I liked watching the subcaps do it. Fair I always yeah, yeah, I, I am with you. But like, so this is because I know a lot of folks have been pretty vocal about like defense. I mean, defense should be like defenders should have an easier time than the attackers, but sometimes it felt like one guy, probably on an alpha account, could defend a structure from a fleet. It doesn't have to be like a 250 man fleet, but like, you know, 50 person fleet without like any effort. And then, so I'm kind of glad that they're changing this up. I remember I did like high sex structure bashing for a while and it was like insane what a, like a single, like an Astra house could do just to like a battleship. And it was like, and not yeah. just a, a battleship, like a battleship with support sort of situation. That yeah. Really in particular, like, especially since dreads when they siege can't receive outside support, a, ship uh, you know a structure that was being attacked by capitals could probably take them down a capital by itself which yeah. made the requirements the 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 yeah the the amount of force that's required to take on one of these things and the acceptable losses to be pretty high right like you don't want to lose a dread every time you try to go after an asters so or even a fortizar so you know that they kind of clean that up a little bit and, and they want you to be able to use dreads a little bit more it's worth noting though that during the road for fan fest they said they've been saying that they want to do a big structure update that applies to how structures interact with the different areas of space and basically upwell 3.0 more or less this is not that i've gotten that correct confirmation this is not the quote-unquote big structure update that they've been talking about this is just the low-hanging fruit yeah, I was going to say, if people are unhappy with these changes, to wait, because FanFest is still coming. I'm assuming what they're going to do is announce it at FanFest and then get feedback from folks at FanFest. So ideally, we see more, like this is just a small piece of the pu puzzle, and we don't right. see what, whatever's left. Man, I've been saying that so often recently. Like every, Almost every question ends with, just wait till fan fest right it's like well do you think they're going yeah. to do this wait till fan fest when is this going to happen wait till fan fest should i quit the game because ccp doesn't care wait till fan fest right like i mean it's going to be i think that a lot of people the problem is is that we haven't had a fan fest for almost three years the average player is like six months to a year which means the vast majority of the player base have no idea what we mean when we say that FanFest is coming, right? Like, this isn't just a normal player gathering. This is the place in which CCP makes their big announcements. So I'm really excited uh, about that, but it's one of those things that, like, people won't realize it until it happens, you know? Yeah, I'm also really sad because I had I had heard talk from both players and CCP of, like, a virtual FanFest, and I'm really sad that they never did that. So I'm... I'm hoping for their sake because I'm gonna be really disappointed if FanFest comes and they only announce like a handful of things and it's like a lot of stuff just got swept under the rug. Or maybe they just don't talk about what they've been doing for the past couple of years. So I'm hoping for their sake that they actually did something for the past couple of years and it was significant enough that now when they're announcing stuff at FanFest, we can kind of see like, oh, that's what they've been doing this whole time. They just no, absolutely, yeah, yeah, like because otherwise I'm gonna be. I have really high. I'm not even going to FanFest this year. Like I don't want to be traveling internationally with the pandemic, but I really have high hopes. Like my bar is set very high for them to actually announce something meaning meaningful. They, they there's a lot on the line, and they have specifically called it out as like you know they've said in some of the latest ecosystem reports that like there's a lot of things coming this year but they're not going to announce it until fan fest so they've literally like put their their money they've, they've all in into the pot right like this is it at this point they have an opportunity to prove to us what this was all for right they yeah. need to be able to show us why we went through the last two years of pain we've we we still don't know it, you know this is their opportunity to show us the metrics this is the opportunity to show us what they've worked on this is the opportunity for them to tell to show the player base why we did all this and that's a big ask but ccp has both completely dropped the ball before but also more recently they've actually knocked it out of the park when it comes to these kinds of events and and announcements and stuff like in 2019 so i'm hopeful but definitely not hopeful enough to be confident. Yeah, I'm in that boat too. 
But like, I don't know. I'm excited. And then there was a question in chat if they are streaming most of FanFest. Key phrase, yes. They'll have, generally they'll have key segments being shown on the broadcast. And then in between they'll have player TV hosts as well as CCP hosts um, discussing things, interviews, etc. So definitely keep an eye out there. And then as far as I'm aware, there's tons of player presentations. And all the player presentations are recorded and put on YouTube after the fact. So if you don't get to see one or you really wanted to see a certain one or whatever, you can also just wait a little bit and they should put those up. And if they don't, I will have Yeah, there's usually it. like big event, the big announce or presentations, art panels, uh, game design panels, the keynote, player, you know, the alliance panels. All those are done on one of the main stages and those are always, you know, recorded and put up there and all that sort of stuff. And then they also have like, round tables which are more intimate affairs that are generally not recorded yeah, that's a good point and then the sort of after hour stuff so pub crawl's not recorded party on top of the world's not recorded none of that stuff is so if you really want to see that you just gotta like stalk people for pictures or ask them to take videos for you will they be streaming ccp games games uh, i think so i think they did it last year so they should do it this year and that's i've always heard is a blast and kind of hilarious It's also, I'm, I'm cur watching it for, not only do I believe that FanFest is going to be, you know, big announcements for EVE Online, but the game, but we also expect announcements involving the IP broadly, right? We've seen previews with this when it comes to the comic book that we've seen the first piece of, but we haven't seen the rest of it. There's the new shooter that they've, of course, been hiring and working on for now three years in its current iteration. There is a lot of hints in the lore that there's about to be a lot of movement when it comes to all these kinds of things and like a development of the story. And you can see from the latest scope videos, the last, you know, four now, that they have vastly improved their animation and video creation systems. So it, it'll be interesting to see how they kind of open up not just the EVE Online oh, client, but also the, just the IP as a whole. Yeah. Did you just predict the return of walking in stations? I, I won't go that far. But another good example of this is, is the uh, creator of Clear Skies is going to be there. We know he's been working on Clear Skies 4. I don't know if they're going to preview any of that or, or whatever, but he is there and he is giving a presentation. So I don't... I don't know what they've been working on this animation f system for exactly. I don't know if it's uh, walking in stations or a new TV show or whatever, but they have put a lot of effort into it. So it'll be interesting to see. Someone, there's also a comment in chat from Gara. We're talking about like sort of content creators being there. The guy who's doing down the rabbit hole. So he said he's created like a five hour video for Eve and he's going to start previewing it as well at, at FanFest. And then they're also having, I think Scott Manley showing up and doing a presentation as well, which yeah, he's a right. huge science YouTuber. Yeah. Ash, you think they're going to talk about Eve Echoes at all? I'm less, I don't think so. I haven't seen any indication from the Echoes side that they would. Because you got to remember, that's a totally different dev team. You know, that is, that's a product that's licensed by CCP to NetEase. And as I said, I haven't seen anything indicating that NetEase is going to be there to talk about that, but who knows? Okay. My, my, my predictions are more about faction warfare, the shooter, the comic book, that kind of stuff. Okay. I think they've had NetEase there before, but I don't, I don't remember. I mean, it's been like, three years since I've been to an Eve, like uh, a CCP Eve meet. The big one was uh, Eve Vegas 2019. They had Netties yeah. there. Okay, and, so they had them there. Yeah, 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 absolutely. But that's my point, is that like, I'm, I've been playing a lot of Echoes recently, and they have been doing updates and announcements and stuff, but I haven't seen anything that's like, we're, we're going to be at FanFest. Check it out. You know, they, ha they haven't oh, been okay. building any hype or anything on that side. I got you. Sorry, Miss is scrolling through what you can kind of expect to see at FanFest. Some of these are old photos, so really exciting stuff. They're also doing, I think we haven't touched on this, they're doing the player tournament. I say player tournament, it's CCP oh ran God. tournament. Yes. But the, the world tour 
finale so you had all these winners from all the different world tour events and so they're finally bringing them all to iceland to finish it finish it or whatever like finish the battle which is funny because i don't know if some of those players like it wouldn't surprise me if some of them had stopped playing in that time you know moved on to other games or just taken the real life break i'd literally forgotten about this when it was first mentioned again by i think cc aurora but yeah so back in 2019 rather than doing a normal fan fest they did the invasion world tour so they did like seven mini fan fests and at each one of those places they had a little tournament and the idea was is that the winner from each of those would go to the next fan fest and they would fight and then the next fan fest never happened <laughs> here we are yeah so the picture artemis is showing is the old ccp logi bro but i think that was yeah was that the invasion world tour it's 2v2 it should be 3v3 there's three dudes in there that might be the kaldari cup from 2018 so CCP is going to fly everyone out. So it was the seven winners of each of the live events, and then they did one online. I think they had like qualifiers and an actual tournament ran by Even T on the CCP channel. So there was, there was an option for people who didn't go to meetups to actually be able to participate. So all of them are going to go. It'll be exciting to see. I, I think good on CCP for, for rem remembering that and staying true to it, right? Like, Throughout all the chaos, we we probably could have just moved on, but you know, CCP is making good on their promise of bringing them out to FanFest. Yeah, it's. I think that's a real good show of good faith because, like, the players were promised, like, you get like the flight. I think it's flights and hotel compensated because of your you being a winner with the with the caveat that you're obviously going to compete and show up and you know not ditch on the tournament. So I think I think that's good. I think it would have been a huge backlash had they not done that. Sorry, my cat says Speaking of backlash, one of the things that I am really worried about when it comes to FanFest is whatever this follow-up is to the Retriever pack, right? Like, during the, oh, during the yeah. crisis when it came to the Retriever pack, they were, you know, CSP Swift said that they were working on a new paradigm and that they would talk more about it at FanFest and about how like, new players are going to get involved. And it, people have speculated that this could be like a, a ship turn-in program or you know something i don't know but this is one of those things that like you know i don't want to sound like we're just fan fanboying or fangirling about it like th there is some very real concerns about what sort of things that they could bring up so i'll just we'll have to wait to see how that works out one of the problems is that we've seen these pieces completely out of context right so once we see the grand yeah. scope of what it is that they're looking for maybe it'll make all it'll all make sense but yeah, that's, they're playing with fire on that one. Yeah, I'm interested to see what their thoughts were because every I feel like every angle I've looked at it, it's always been like mostly negative and like not a good addition. So I'm curious to see how they how they're going to justify it and like what the true scope of the the thing is. Well, the, the right. real well, issue with that was hmm? that they were taking they were taking things that were built by players in the game and they were selling it for cash, right? So if the only real solution then is to then buy those items from the players in the game and then sell them for cash. That's so we, I don't know. I don't, I don't know what they can do with NPC buy orders and NPC characters in the game. If they can use those NPC buy orders to buy things from players and then turn around and turn those into contracts, that they can then sell for cash right, to the store. E even if they did that, that would still be CCP now joining in on the player market. Right, because those buy orders are now competing with all of the other ways to sell those ships. Right, but the nice thing about a, a buy order is that you don't have to sell it. Do you know what I mean? Like, so if they put right, a buy but, order up and it's my, what I'm less than the that value people, of a ship, then... other people that want to put in buy orders now need like they they're basically setting the floor. You know what I mean? Right, but if you look at like red loot from from abyssals. If if you go and sell it to an NPC, you get like X number of isk from it. But if you sell it to a player character, you get a little bit less or more, depending on how well someone plays the market. Right? So the same thing could happen with a retriever. If they're selling if the going price for a retriever is says say 50 million isk, I don't even know what it is. Let's say it's 50 million isk, and the NPCs put up buy orders for 49 million isk, well, they're not gonna be able to buy any retrievers because they're undercutting the market. Does that make sense? Well, that's my point is that 
either they if they're buying it for isk either they are manipulating the market by setting a new price a competitive price or they're just not going to fill their orders in which case what are they doing it for in the first place right this is why i think that what this like likely will be is a new currency system right you turn it in for a different kind of thing that you can use to get something else because it can't just have a standard isk value otherwise they're setting the price this would be uh, i feel like it's also super manipulable by players like let's say ccp are like hey buy this at ship so you're like fuck yeah dude i want to buy an at ship so you click out pay thousand dollars for like a maraca or something like that and then the people who own the maracas in game are just like yeah we're not going to sell these so then bam free maraca implemented into the game and that's the only thing like i, I want to like, stress that there's been no indication that they're going to sell at ship there isn't, but you know how much money they can make? So the, let's, let's be real, though. The, the reason why they're doing this is because new players don't know how to fit ships. This all goes back to the Destroyer Pack. The problem is, is that, so the Destroyer Pack is like, what, 16 bucks or something like that? And it comes with a month of game time and a Destroyer, which basically means your Destroyer costs a buck, right? Now... Can you buy a dollar with a you know a, a destroyer with a dollar worth of plex? Hell yeah, they're super cheap. But here's the problem: a you know one of the things that CCB discovered is it doesn't matter if they sell you some plex and say, okay, you can use this to go get a ship, because those players don't know how to do that. They don't know how to turn plex into isk, buy their fit. Some of them don't even know to go to Jita, right? Like so. What they discovered is the difference between giving you the money for the ship versus the fit ship, like that is the single largest barrier to entry, is the actual act of fitting, getting a fit ship. So by selling them like that, one of the things that they discovered, according to what I've heard, is that not only do people that buy the destroyer pack end up still are like being happy with not only are people buying the destroyer pack but those who do end up staying in the game more more often because that it helps them pass that hurdle that is why they have this impulse to con to push this further with other newer what well, new new player focused stuff or maybe maybe not new quote unquote absolute new but like step two you know like a tech one money barge so I don't expect it to like go crazy to like Titans or whatever, because that's not the demographic they're trying to sell to. That doesn't actually meet their goals. But cruisers, the mining barges, these kinds of things are probably fair game, to be honest. Let's be honest. So there's only like six people in this game who know how to fit a ship and we're all just trading their fits back and forth. That is very accurate. I mean, you're not wrong. <laughs> The issue I have with cruisers is the logistics of it. So I don't want them to sell cruisers through the store that you can just magically have appear inside your wormhole when you redeem it to your Citadel. That is a big, I mean, that is an issue and that is a piece to it. And I don't think enough people have really brought focus to that when it came to the mining barge. The fact that you could actually spawn it anywhere is actually a value that should not be underestimated. I think it's also worth pointing out because chat's kind of talking this and... I mean, I share the same sentiments. Why don't they just teach players how to fit ships? Or not even like, oh my God. Not, not how to fit. You could say, here's how to find and use a fit. Because it's like, oh, you know, like, like me playing the game for eight years, I barely know how to fit my own ship. Like sometimes I get the prop mod size wrong and stuff like that, like super basic stuff. But I always know if I go to contracts and I buy from my alliance contracts, or if I go to Z kill and I can copy the Z kill fit, like I find a kill mail of Suetonia and I just copy the fit. Like I at least know someone else smarter than me fit that ship and it's probably decently okay. Right. And th there's a couple problems with that. One, that's counterintuitive, isn't it? Right? Like, I, I've i explained this to many new players. You oh, have to leave go the to game to find out how to play the well, game. No, 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 not just that. Yes. I'm going to go look at ships that have died to find what to do. Sounds really bad to a person that doesn't understand EVE, right? right. Why would That's I the want... the conversation I had on Twitter earlier this morning was that why would I go on Z Killboard to find Suetonia's fucked up fits when I can just yeah. ask him on Twitter and he can give me the good one? Why, why, would I, why would I use a, 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 dump, a bad fit? Why would I use the fit that died? 
And the answer is, is that everything dies eventually, right? But I, I think that it's not, it's definitely not as clean as just, hey, go to Z Killer. Hey, just go to E Workbench because it's, it's still difficult to sift out the good from the bad, as it were. I, I agree. I strongly agree that the real fundamental problem here is that CCP does not teach you how to fit a ship. It doesn't give you confidence in, in how to even, you know, like the, the meta concepts. It may say, you know, here's a web, but it doesn't explain, hey, here are the considerations when making a fit. What weapon system you're going to use, what tank system you're going to use, what prop system you're going to use, how are you going to manage your cap? Like, like they don't teach you the, the actual concepts that you have to think about when you're fitting a ship. And that is the root source of a lot of these problems. Because that's such an interesting gameplay. It reminds me of Need for Speed Underground, right? Like people would spend hours like tweaking little things about their, their car, but because it was all in context, they, they felt empowered to do so. In Eve, it's just like, I don't know. Like there's so much complexity that they're just locked out from. Yeah. I think I think also too. So like I get Z Kill and Eve Workbench probably not the best sources, but like community fits. Like I as a player know, oh, I'm gonna do the Sisters of Eve Epic Arc. I should go to the community fits because that's what CCP made them for. New players wouldn't it be nice if that. CCP told you about them? Yeah, like that one's so simple. Like even with me explaining to somebody how to get to the community fitting, it's a journey, man. Like like I. I would love to find out the statistics of how many people have actually successfully found and utilized the community fitting without somebody telling them to do it. I'm guessing a very, very small number. Yeah, and I thought it was like a huge accomplishment too, I think when community fittings came out, because like they were voted on by players. Mm -hmm. Like I remember they had like a whole forum thing and people like argued and debated and then they we picked the best one, quote, best because, you know, they're still kind of bad fits. But at the same time, it's like, it was such a great accomplishment. CCP finally put them in, and then they did nothing with them. So nobody knows except players trying out yeah. new accounts. And they've actually expanded them. They've added more ships to it since the initial pass. But again, yeah. they don't bring anybody's attention to it. So what the hell's the point? Yeah, it's been, that part's really disappointing. It's just like the, the, the fact that the help window of the agency has all kinds of really great tutorials built into the client now. You can just watch videos on how to scan and all that. All of the Eve Academy videos that are on the YouTube are literally viewable inside of the client. In fact, you can link them in chat. Most people that, don't even know these things exist. That's actually really impressive, the fact that you can link it in chat and watch it in-game. Right. But that being said, I suspect, I hope, that... What's really happening is that FanFest is going to bring all these pieces together, right? That, that, you know, because the thing is, is that the problem with all these systems isn't that they're bad. It's that, that CCP doesn't actually breadcrumb people to any of them. So it's, it's, it's not even about like making new features. It's about creating the bonds between these things, you know, making sure that Aura explains to you about community, you know, oh, well, if you need a new fit, Go check out the community fittings if you need a, need some ideas. You know, like all you have to do is point people to them. So, my hope yeah. is, uh, with all of this, you know, rework and trying to build things up, especially for the newer players and stuff like that, that that they'll focus on unlocking the things that are already there for people. Yeah, hopefully we see something like that rolled out at least soon within the year. Otherwise, I have no idea what CCP is going to be what? doing. One of the things I find really funny, for example, is so in the old career agents, it tells you to mine Tritanium. And this has bothered me for a long time. Because it's like so many new players literally warp to the site, see Veldspar everywhere, and then warp off. They're like, oh, there's no Tritanium here. <laughs> so they leave because they were told it's, to mine Tritanium. That's accurate, though. Yeah. So, but what's funny is that the new mining career agent explicitly takes time to explain to you that you must refine Veldspar to get Tritanium. It's almost like the, M the uh, new MPE's agent is like explaining this to the old career <laughs> agent, like directly identifying that one previous problem, which is, you know, good, but we'll see. I know that CCP has been working really, really, really hard on this new 
you know, MPC, MPE build out. So we'll have to see where it keeps going. Yeah, for sure. So that's a that's a lot for in-game news. Did you guys Photon. have anything else? You want to talk about Photon? We do not have the stuff ready for Photon because I wanted to actually explore that and get it oh, ready for a There's a good forum post about Photon specifically and how they were talking about compact mode. It's one of yes. the complaints with Photon was all the padding around the around the window and how it's so big. Now there's a they're adding a button to it to the windows where you can turn it into compact mode, which squishes everything down. Oh bless. You know, like Thank one, you. One third the size of a of a regular window. Yeah. One of the things that I all I'll stress about Photon, first of all, there's two features involved in this. There is the preview system, and then there's the actual photon itself. Right. So the idea is is that CCP wants to give us the opportunity to test out new features without necessarily having to like go to singularity to test it in you know that artificial environment. So, you know, like for instance, then you know how there's all those toggles for like the new map versus the old map or you know whatever. They they've now created a, a place to put that sort of stuff in the future. Photon itself is the new UI design scheme to try to unify all of the different UI elements. Obviously, there's a lot wrong with it at the moment, but it's it it is as they've said, very early beta. And therefore, you know, I strongly recommend, you know, you can flip on UI, uh, Photon to check it out, give your feedback or whatever, but it's not necessarily ready for prime time. I don't use it for my actual, like, flying around when things matter because you never know. There's things that just go wrong. There are things that, like, get pushed out of the window and then you can't even interact with it. So it's, it's fun for t testing and dinking around and finding errors and submitting bug reports, but I wouldn't use it for live flight yeah i think that's worth pointing out though what you're saying ash is feel free for folks in the chat and folks watching on the vods feel free to give it a try and when you do find errors because there are 100 percent will be instead of just complaining on social media because i know that's what i do actually submit a bug ticket and then like submit that and then like you can tweet it at ccp say hey you really screwed up on this here's the ticket and they are actually like consolidating and trying to figure out a lot of these so i know i've seen it mm. Excuse me. I've seen a lot in the partner Discord. Partners will complain, and then they submit the bug ticket, and CCP like immediately is like, "Hey, thanks. We're gonna add to this. Like, you're not the first person, or oh, this is the first time we've seen this. Like, we're trying to work on it and figure it out." So CCP has yeah. like been super collaborative again with players trying to figure stuff out. I would argue that they have been aggressive when it comes to trying to get player feedback. You know, they've been extremely proactive with with hunting down what we have to say and and implementing it. The thing the thing about the Photon UI that's tricky is that this isn't just like, they're not individually crafting each window, you know? They're just creating a new set of rules for how these things are presented. Like, so in the back end, it's just like, oh yeah, there's a button, it's, in, it's you know, bottom right justified, all these kinds of things. And so the Photon UI takes all the information and then builds the UI to make unified. So that way all buttons look the same and all, you know, padding looks the same and all, yeah, all that sort of stuff. But the issue is, is that while this works for all of the things that you would normally look at, it's those edge cases that end up being the biggest problems, right? So if you look at your corporation logo as an individual window, that corporation logo is completely off the, off of the window. If you try to insurance, those in, the insurance options are non-clickable because they are below the window. But again, these are these are technically edge cases. So it's all about hunting those down, identifying them, and fixing them. Yeah, so make sure when you're going out there and finding stuff to report it. So like you don't even have to tell anyone. You just make the ticket, post some screenshots, and you're good. I mean, you can post it for, to Reddit too for Karma and have some fun with it, but make sure oh, yeah. to submit the real ticket. But then, yeah, if you post on social media, the, yeah, when you post on social media and then they fix it, you get all the bragging rights. That's how it works. Exactly. Exactly. All right. Do we want to shift to... I know we have LB here. Do we want to shift to some player news? LB looks at me. Sure. All confused. LB, you yeah. want to talk about what's going on in the South? I know last week we talked about the Dread Brawl with you and Thomas. Faith Abolus is on fire. And there's no one there to put the flames out. So I know we made some predictions last week about the SIGs from Pandemic Horde and Test maybe continuing to fight, but it turns out they aren't. They're 
their structures burning. Fire has their, I believe it's fire structures, but probably some of Horton's test as well. But fire's not defending at all, I'm guessing. No, like we said last week, fire is, is a huge sprawling uh, group that stretches like halfway across New Eden. All those systems are pretty much empty with one or two players actually living in them. So when they when they tried to push on Esoteria, they brought their friends Test and Pandemic Horde, and they were having pretty decent success, putting pretty heavy pressure on, on RMC. When RMC calls their friends initiative in the Imperium and they push back, the front line very quickly collapsed. Fire is pretty much sucked back to their uh, major major regions. And they've left Faith Abolis sort of to die in a fire as it is right now. Little groups like Moonpire, which is basically one guy with six alts, all flying Eoses. Like that, that guy's getting his stuff pushed in. There's a group called Costco, which seems to be taking a bunch of, of space in here, which is a Cosmic Coalition, I think they're called. I've never heard of them, but they seem to be taking Sov and no one's taking it back from them. So I don't know who that is, but that's uh, that's interesting. I think the whole intent here was to burn faith kind of like they did pure blind and then let whoever wants to move back in there and fill that vacuum. And I think Costco is is scooping up everything they can right now. Yeah, the Imperium has stated that they have no long term plans for faith they're just you know ripping it apart there's two things i want to point out when it comes to fire coalition just for some context first of all fire coalition completely stayed out of world war b so while the rest of the universe was punching each other in the face fire was expanding pretty readily and without any real opposition so they probably had more territory than they rightfully could control even from go but then secondly the core while while fire coalition has worked to kind of reach out and and expand their their base fire predominantly at its core is a russian alliance and so a lot of the real life stuff likely disrupted their leadership channels and 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 some of their forces so they're they're on the back foot and overextended. Yeah. yeah. I they didn't necessarily stay out of World War B. They were in World War B. I know because I was there with fire. I used to be in fire. But they didn't really like they didn't move their staging right to T5, for example, right? Like they stayed right. back. Sorry, you're right. They didn't but they didn't commit in a way that caused they didn't they didn't suffer as much damage and they were able to expand their, they, they focused on expanding their territory. Yeah. Very much like frat did, but yes. on a, a much smaller scale. Yep. A lot of attention was on frat, but, but fire was quietly benefiting from the fact that everybody else was being violent. Yeah. It's worth pointing out too, that like you were saying, fire is mostly Russian time zone. Frat is, has a lot of China time zone folks. Uh, a lot of Imperium and most Pappy forces were EU or US time zone. So it makes sense that, I mean, time zone differences, you move your entire forces somewhere and then they're getting ready to fight. And then all they're doing is like absolutely nothing day in and day out because their prime time is when everyone else is sleeping. So I can kind of see why they wouldn't move, at least move all their forward staging like some of the other alliances. But yeah, as far as, far as I know, I don't think, at least internally, so I'm in PL, there was no talk of them like abandoning the war, not participating like it was expected or whatever. That's fair. I, mean, I could be completely wrong on that. I saw it like I have contacts in fire, so I mostly saw what they were doing outside of the war. So maybe I and, assumed well, that they were doing less in it. I think, too, if I remember correctly, because was fire near? I thought there was at one point. I think it was initiative was going like behind enemy lines and attacking structures. So they tried it in drone space and it didn't work out too well. Like they didn't follow up on anything. And when they did, they got pushed in. But then I think fire too was one of the groups that had other people attacking them during the war. And I don't know if it was an initiative or if it was something else. Yeah. Initiative was in the backfield. The funny thing about uh, fire is that frat would occasionally attack them specifically in and around, in and around curse. 
they would push they would push on their solve there and uh fire would sort of just like ignore it or take it i don't know what the deal is was there but it's kind of a weird situation relationship but yeah Fra- initiative was doing a lot of work in the backfield once rmc split off from we were pushing a lot in the backfield in places like catch and query some places like that out of uh moving out of stain so there was uh there definitely was some pressure on them during the war a little bit yeah which is probably another reason why they didn't move all the way up so that that just helps your point ash all right so Phithabolus is burning no one's really defending burning via structure bashes and solventosising, which for those who don't know, when those aren't defended, they're actually quite boring, unless you have like a good engaging group that you're flying with. But yeah, the, yep, so there's all the structures that were being shown on stream. I don't believe there's any keep stars, but it looks like quite a few Astra houses and Fortizars. I'm not sure if there's much else. In terms of infrastructure setup, because I don't think... Oh, okay, there are Athenors. Okay, I was going to say it didn't look like there were, but yeah, there are Athenors. Well, I mean, I, I assume that there'd be Athenors if they're mining moons. Well, I didn't know how long Fire had lived there, or like moved in, and how dedicated they were. So that would have been my only hesitation, because if you're not going to stay somewhere for a long time, there's no point in throwing Athenors up. Fair point. It looks like they at least wanted to stay for a little bit. Yeah, the intent was to create a sprawling empire that they could then rent out or farm out. Unfortunately, when you don't have enough people, you just have empty space with structures in it, and now they're all suffering this this fate. Yeah, I got the sense that their strategy was to kind of lay low and let the World War B and fraternity kind spotlight which allowed them to get a lot of work done but wasn't really great for recruitment yeah people love safe crabbing space but they also like content engaging content as well so i'm guessing i don't know how long it takes to flip all this out but i'm guessing by a week or two from now faith Abolus will be fully burned and probably not have a lot of content unless Unless these new groups moving in are going to do something radical. And that's the hope, right? Like this Costco group that's scooping everything up. I've, I foresee them not being able to hold all six or eight constellations that are within Faith Abolus. So you'll, you're going to see uh, smaller groups maybe dip their toe into, into Sov, come in, take some from Costco. Or perhaps you might see a new small coalition form in this system with Costco as the, as the core. I'm not sure. We'll have to watch and shoot and see what happens. Might have some new neighbors. Definitely worth keeping an eye on. Yeah. Did you guys hear they, I think it was, accidentally blowing up their own iHub? Yeah. Oh, uh, yes, yeah. <laughs> so that's their staging iHub. And it went kaboom. And then I saw, was it, somebody posted like a screenshot of a Discord saying, hey guys, we have an idiot director. This blew up. Just give us some time, we'll fix it. Because obviously if your iHub blows up, you got to install a new one, and then it's essentially a waiting game to get those upgrades. Yeah, so there are three indexes, or there are three metrics that, that create your, strate- your, what is it, ADMs, Active Defense Multiplier. So you have your military, which is how, much you, how many rats you're killing. There's your industry, which is how much rocks you're mining. But then there's strategic. Strategic is based on how many days you that iHub has existed in that system and so there's a lot of checkpoints uh, sino beacons sino jammers all that kind of stuff that requires a certain number of time to- a certain amount of time that you have to have held the uh, system non-stop by the iHub detonating that basically reset that timer yeah so that's that affects things like like jump bridges capital production is there anything else that affects well sino jammer was a big one yeah, i remember jammers. like during world war b remember the doomsday clock that was because of the same feature right that was yeah the amount of days until they could have a sino jammer but also i mean it all it means that their adm is low you know that system's vo- more vulnerable to take over in theory than otherwise 
So someone in chat is asking about, sorry, this is unrelated, but I wanted to call it out. Someone's asking that they're returning for after five years of not playing. And they're asking for tips. I know Carneros on the CCP stream. So if you go to twitch.tv slash CCP and look at the VODs, you can see Carneros did shows about like returning players and how to catch them up and some of the changes. Otherwise, check out YouTube and patch notes because there's tons of stuff that has changed in the last five years. Man, this is one of those things that Echoes does so well. So they have a, a a thing that pops up that like shows you all of the, you know, the the limited time events, very much like the agency. If it didn't have any of the normal stuff, like it was only events and announcements and such. But one of the things it has is what has happened. And so like the last couple like year or two of patches are just in the client and there's little diamonds at the bottom and you can click on each one and kind of look at what was changed at each point. So you can go back to wherever you are and then see what has happened. That is so good. <laughs> they need that. Like a since you've been gone kind of a thing. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I feel, like, I feel like all games need that. Like, hey, you haven't played for a month. Here's how the buttons work and here's all the weird <laughs> like quality of life changes or whatever. It's absolutely true. But with... With Eve, it's a big thing. I will say, as a person who's coming back for five years, realize that there has been significant baseline changes to like most of the core concepts, the way that the market works, the way that industry works, the way that mining works. So, you know, look at it as a from kind of new eyes and and don't you know have your old assumptions is what I would recommend. A lot has changed in five years. Yeah. That covers the age of prosperity and the age of scarcity. <laughs> yeah, that's both. I'm trying to think. So we talked about Faith Abilis. Oh, I was say, LB, did you have anything else you wanted to discuss regarding Faith Abilis? No, wrong is recruiting. So you guys can join LB's corporation slash alliance. I'm um, leaving ESO, which is right next right. to Faith Abilis. It's a small, small commute. All right, sorry, my cat's screaming at me. So Cat TSA, the other thing that's... Oh, no, we're talking about the Wolf BPO. So BPOs are Blueprint, oh, God. Blueprint Originals. For the most part, some of the some of the T1 ones you can like buy from NPCs. They're pretty straightforward. You research them and then you can like endlessly produce thrashers or procurers or whatever. There's the super rare kind that are extremely expensive called T2 BPOs. For those who don't remember, there was a lot of drama around T2 BPOs being implemented into the game. And one died recently. An individual bought it on contract and then flew it around in a shuttle and died to a smart bomb. So in Amazon. So speaking of the whole five year thing, one thing that might be worth noting is that certain star systems are no longer connected and some other star systems are connected in ways that they weren't before. So during the course of invasions, the 27 star systems that were taken by the Triglavians are now disconnected from the gate network. And one of the most notable one of these is Nyarja. So the previous eight jump link between Amar and Jita has now been broken and turned into a 40 plus jump route. However, then during the uh, Stargate Trailblazer event, we built new Stargates, including one from Abazon to Cal all the way out to Amar space. So now, there's a there's a short way between Amar and Jita. It's like eight, uh, nine, ten jumps, I think. However, it has one system of low sec, Abazon, which has made Abazon by far into one of the most deadliest systems in the entire game all the time. So it's one of those things that like, it's kind of like Rancer times two, you know, like people think that they can get by on it. But man, you need to be prepared for smart bombs in that place. Let me tell you. Yes, this guy bought the BPO, probably worth like billions of ISK, if not more. And then he flies yeah. out and promptly loses it. So basically, in the early days, the way that these BPOs were made was through a lottery system. You know, if you got lucky, you were just given. And then eventually they created the invention system. So now you would have to 
take a blueprint of the Tech One equivalent, so in this case a Rifter, you would make copies of it, and then you combine that with some data cores and uh, a decryptor if you want to use a decryptor, and that has a chance of turning into a T2 BPO, or BPC rather. And so you have to continuously invent these things in order to get more and more copies. And of course, you know, people need lots of these T2 ships. So a lot of invention needs to happen. If you have the D, if you have the BPO, you can just run copies of it. And not just that, but when you invent something, it resets the time efficiency and material efficiency. So, and that's based on what decryptor you use and stuff like that. So chances are most of the T2 BPOs or BPCs rather have really low ME and TE. It's just really good that they exist. A BPO can be researched. So while everybody else is running around with like one or five TE or uh, uh, material efficiency, you have 10% material efficiency. So not only are you printing out these BPCs where everybody else is trying to do chance invention, your BPCs actually are better than theirs. They cost less. They are faster. And you can just print them out. So it's not just like, hey, we like wolves. It is literally an ISK printing machine that's just in your pocket. These things are so relevant that the entire T20 scandal, the entire world, uh, like first great war, the big thing that like the reason why the CSM exists is because what two BPOs, T2 BPOs were put into the game unfairly. So, you know, these are big deals. Was it and really only one, two? I think it was two or three. Sorry, I was actually, I when, I found out what, when I found out what they were, I can't remember right now, but I, I, was, I was being very surprised. It was like a, literally like a missile. One of, them, one of them was a missile, I thought. And then one of them was like a, a T2 ship. But either way, I don't remember the details of that. But my point is, is that these are extraordinarily uh, valuable and sought after things. And now this one doesn't exist. Yeah, and, and now there's, the no, old... there's no way to make a T2 BPO now, is there? Like, it's, no, it's not. The only way to have a T2 BPO is to have had one from the, from like literally 2005, 2006 era. And right. I have a friend like who's convinced that there's like a minuscule, like 0.01% chance that if you make a copy of a, of a fucking BPC <laughs> or BPO, that it, you might get a T2 BPO, so he's just been copying things for his entire that, career. That is some, that is some urban tale level shit right it, there. It that is, is, it is, that is Slender Man. <laughs> That's really funny though. That that would be terrible. Actually, even if that percent, because of how much stuff people make, then someone would have definitely created one. Yeah, right. we would know about it. Pretty sure. Like it's just myths and urban legends, and he's taking it as truth. Yeah, but extremely valuable. Obviously, this guy not taking it seriously enough. And the fact that it also died when he died just shows that, like, now that Wolf BPO is no longer in existence. Yeah, Luke Ferry said no. That makes me happy. If it had dropped, then I would have been like, meh. Because that's just it changing hands and going into the yeah the nasty people's hands. But the fact, I was actually just thinking about this today, because like or the other day, because, like, EVE Online really is a game in which, like, brutish people pick on less brutish people right like uh, on some level it kind of works that way right because the the more aggressive people are more organized they're better combat people and so they end up you know kicking the teeth in of the people that build stuff that focus more on building things up however so like I, at first i was like this is just another example of like power of being fed towards the violent but the fact that things get destroyed is the counterforce to that, right? It just gets sunk out. Yeah, for sure. It's interesting though. I'm like, I don't know, maybe maybe I just have like too much anxiety, but like when I have really expensive stuff, I just leave it in the station. Or if it's in a citadel, I ask at safety it and then I never touch it again. I'm like, good, now it's out of my right. now it's out of my hands. Don't gotta worry about it, never touching it. The other night on stream, like two weeks ago, I decided to get in the industry. So I bought a couple of BPOs in Jita. But I also have a pile of those free. Remember the, the free BPCs you can get from the logins, which I actually enjoy because I collect them. I have a giant pile of them. Well, they, I have a, you don't a get pile them of a, No, I know. 
I have a pile of abyssal BPCs as well. So like, you can, what are they? The, the frigates, right? What are they called? Fucking yeah, Damavix. Right. And there's a Jerkovac, there's Lashax, all those. I have piles of those. And I wanted to get them down in Nullsec to use them. So I was on stream. So I went to the Be Right Back screen and I sh threw them all in the shuttle and was like, fuck it, let's go. And then I took it, put it back alive and I flew it to Nullsec. And then at the end of it, I, I exposed like, this is what was in the shuttle. And people in chat were like, what the fuck is wrong with you? I was like, ah, whatever. What's, what's the worst that could happen? What could possibly go wrong? Well, if oh you're an gosh. Abazon, a lot. Yep, that's right. <laughs> they have way too much anxiety for that. I, how, I, how do you have that kind of thing and still think that just like blindly shuttling through a low sex system is like perfectly okay? I just, I don't understand. Have you ever heard uh, the term more money than sense? I, sure. So you're saying you're really rich, LB? Is that it? No, I'm no, just saying no this, not me. No, the BPL, All my stuff the, was stuff that I collected oh. from the gutter. I'm just this saying like the C2 sequence BPL. of events that leads you to, to both having a wolf BPO and needing to move it between Gita and Amar and still not having the, 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 the mental skill set to understand what kind of danger they're getting themselves into. That's astonishing to me. It's like the, that orca that died a little while ago that had like a ton of BPOs in its collection, but like apparently he'd been playing the game for 10 years and just never had a problem until one day he was carrying too much in an in a orca and to Yudama. You know, like it's, it's a crazy game, man. That's one of the things is like we always talk about like people don't do this, people always do that. Oh, nobody would ever do this. If there's a mistake that can be made in this game, there are people making it. All the time, like I don't, I don't understand it because like I am so, it's like we do move ops in Eve, like with my alliance. I'm like super picky about like doing my move op and making sure I only have what I need, and then I'm with the fleet and I'm doing everything the FC says. And even then, like there will be times where someone's like, "Hey, I have an extra Nix, can someone move it?" So I'm like, "Oh, I have a Nix pilot." So I like fly my pod, which I triple checked, did not have the implants in. Fly the pod to the station or the citadel, get in the Nix. And then I'm like doing everything the FC says. I'm shaking the whole time. I'm like, oh my God, this isn't even my Nyx. Like what happens if I lose it? I can't, like I have to give him my Nyx then. And then I fly it and like zero, like there was like literally like 0% risk because I was with a fleet and we had backup and faxes and shit. And the whole time I'm just like this nervous wreck. Like I, like if I had a BPO, I just like literally wouldn't touch it. I just put it in those containers, like slap the keyboard for the password and leave it. Like never touch it again. It's it's funny. And it's yet there like are those people group. who are like, oh, I missed the move up. YOLO. Here we go. I'm sure it'll be fine. It's like a it's like a kind of done. So there's like two different types of people that do this, right? Like I've definitely known cowboys, you know, like haulers that get to the point where they almost become numb to the danger and just get crazier and crazier with their jump freighters. But like in this case, I think it's closer to like a Dunning Kruger effect, right? Like you were nervous not because there was an obvious and present danger, but because you understood the game enough to know what kind of danger was possible, right? It was all in your head. So if you were completely unaware of the danger, then why would you have any level of paranoia? Why would you worry about anything? Why not just autopilot, right? Like if you don't understand what kind of danger there is out there, then you wouldn't take any precautions against it. That's a good point. Like maybe maybe I'm like just so in tune with like because I stream and all this, if I didn't stream, I would have like no idea all this crazy stuff happening. You know, like streaming, being involved with the community, like talking to folks. So like I knew all the like I know the risks of flying through low sec because one, I used to do it, but two, because I see stuff like this. But if I didn't pay attention, I'd have no idea. And this really reinforces what I like to say a lot, which is, you know, go out there and play the game. Like just just you know, don't do, don't always just do the, like, the super safe, I'm in my one little corner, as your only, like, content outside the fleets. Like, you, you may think it's boring, but just going out there and trying to do stuff, like, you run into the craziest shit. I mean, when I was running around Venal, I, there was a regional gate, so it was away from all the planets, so I couldn't get a D-scan of it, but I was like, oh, thank God, there, there's a, there's an Astrohoose there. 
I'll warp to that. And I, as I'm warping, I'm worried, like, I hope there's not like a drag bubble or some mechanic that I'm not aware of when it comes to this. I'm going to get caught in something. And then I land and there's a fleet of 90 munins right in front of me and an Astrohoose that's at 10% armor. Or, uh, sorry, hull. And I'm like, oh, okay. So I got to watch Fraternity kill this Astrohoose. Like, there was no way I would have predicted that I would have seen that when it, when I, because when I was doing exploration, I'm thinking I'm going to find sites. I'm going to find sites that I don't care about. And I'm going to potentially have somebody try to like kill me like a saber on a, gr on a gate or something like that. Right. Like these are the kinds of things that we would worry about, but like Eve is boring. If it's only in our head, it's when you get out there and actually try to like do things in practice that you run into the most wild shit. That's some of the best stuff, though. Like I remember all these people telling me all this stuff about Eve, like don't trust anyone. Everyone's trying to kill you. But some of the best experiences I've had have been like when I'm just chilling and there's someone in local and they're like, hey, can someone help me look in this wormhole? And I'm like, oh, yeah, dude, this guy is clearly bae. He's going to murder me. So we fleet up and I like warp to the wormhole. And no, he's genuinely a newbie. He's never seen a wormhole before. And he probed it down and we're looking through the wormhole. So then I am having to teach him like you have to bookmark it. You can look for data sites. And like he was just like so excited. And this whole time I was like, no, this dude's bait. Like obviously he's like setting a trap, but. It was a genuine person trying something new who needed help. And like, not even, not even that, but like I would run missions in high sec. There was always someone who's like, Hey, does anyone want to team up for missions? And it's like, you know, you always think they're going to AWOX me or steal my loot. It's like, Nope, they just want to fly with someone in the game. And some of that stuff is like super wholesome. So taking that risk and going out there is actually a lot of fun. This is, this is why I always say that Eve online is a game about the practical application of bad ideas. That's a very accurate. <laughs> All right. Caddy is say. No, okay. Artemis has it pulled up. So Caddy is has been doing the Eve travel, the new Eden traveler series. So this one's called honor and love in probably Latin, which I can't pronounce. And so it's the exploration through the series. It's like him and Mark. Oh gosh. Mark with a bunch of numbers or web spaceships. And 762. On yeah, 762. And so they they go out and look at the monuments in Eve. I know, Ash, you probably know a lot about this because I know you do a lot of the exploration stuff as well. So this one's specifically the history of war, battle monuments, and the Molea cemetery, cemetery. Excuse me. I was going to say ceremony, but that was inaccurate. So definitely check out the series on YouTube. It's very informative. You can, I think the voicing is by Manic Velocity as well. So if you really like Manic, his voice is like buttery sex. Oh, right there. It, even, it even gives him credit. So you guys should go give it a, give it a view. I don't think you're, oh, you are showing that on stream. Okay. That's the other thing. Seven, it's 726, not 762. I was seven, yeah, March 726. Yeah. So... The other thing is that I, I'm even, I've, I found out that I was guilty of this, you know, pay attention to the systems around you. You know, there's not, not every, the systems aren't all the same. There are landmarks all over the place. There is things to poke at and look at and wonder what it's there for. Chances are, you know, they, there's something in the area around you. you. It could be in the system that you've been in this whole time. And if you've never really thought about it, then you know, whatever, but there's these kinds of landmarks and everything all over the place. This, this universe has a lot of history. Yeah. And not just, I mean, I know a lot of players talk a lot about, you know, some of the more iconic ones, like the Eve gay Molea. That's, that's a big one. The, the battle monument. But there's a lot of ones where like, it's even all lore related. So CCP will add in a bunch of random stuff that's purely lore related that players don't really know about. Sorry, my cat one's on my desk. And so some of those, like if you just fly around and take a look, check things out, it'd be really interesting. Especially the cosmos, you know, the cosmos constellations have all kinds of different locations and stuff to look at and poke at because they're part of the cosmos. But even without that, there are landmarks, both new and old. You know, they've, they've put in quite a few new landmarks. OMS now has its own unique gate. There's some pretty cool cosmic phenomena all over the place, which, by the way, you can find that cosmic phenomena in the map. I did that the other day. I was just bored and like wandering around. And so I opened up the map and noticed 
that uh, the serpent's coil was actually like marked on the map in the middle between these site systems. And so I just set destination to the system near it or next to it and headed that way and then took screenshots of, of the core of the elements. Sorry, not the, not the serpent's coil, but the coil of the element. Nice. So yeah, yeah they're pretty cool. And here's another good one. If you're in the, in, if you're interested in seeing landmarks and are okay with a little bit of danger, if you go to the project discovery site, uh, phase one monument and hit it with a, with an entosis device, it begins a, a treasure hunt where you have to go to, I think four other sites, one of which is pretty dangerous and in low sec. But if you complete all of them, that's how you can build black glass, which are the incredibly powerful hacking implants. That's super cool. I had no idea. Oh, Cody is in chat, chat and posting. Eve Travel's website is phenomenal. Like, so Mark726 has been documenting these landmarks for longer than I've been playing this game, I think. And he has this website called Eve Travel, which Katia just posted, uh, that has all of these different sites, good information about them. Mark has actually now been given his own landmark, thanks to his efforts doing Eve Travel. He, they, they've added the Eve Travel Agency to his home system. But uh, the other thing, since we're talking about it, I really want to pimp out the fact that Mark has also written the Hitchhiker's Guide. No, not the shoot i can't remember exactly what it's called but it's the lore bible he may he wrote like a full book that like goes over all of the different factions and what's going on with them and all that stuff and he keeps it pretty well updated too so if you if you want like a single book that will like catch you up with everything with all the different groups and what they're up to uh, mark's uh, mark's write-up is is phenomenal yeah, so he goes by Web Spaceships online, and I found him because I think it was like my first Vegas. He was he was that guy who would sit in on all the presentations and live tweet that they were talking about. So there there would be times where I would go to a presentation and then he would go to a different one, and so I'd be listening and watching the presentation and then also browsing his Twitter. And so for those who aren't going to FanFest, I I assume he is, but he's one of those people where I would just like follow him. Because he, like, if you're not there, he, he's like a really good guide to help folks back home kind of connect. It's called the Lore Survival Guide. But yeah, no, absolutely. He's, a, he's an incredibly informative dude. And he doesn't try, he doesn't generally stray away from that. You know, my, my Twitter is a lot of good information, but it's also up to 40% fat cat girl. You know, Mark's is, or Web Spaceship is, is, is just good information mostly. Yeah, he's a good dude. He's like Katia. Super wholesome. Focus on like the community and bringing things to the community. Do you guys say, LB or Ash, do you guys have anything else around the New Eden Traveler series or this latest episode? Nope. I think that actually covers everything that we had planned today then we're right coming to right up on the two hour mark as well green there's one final announcement in podcast channel for you okay so one moment oh yeah, yeah okay so there was one more thing we wanted to talk about was around mad lightning who's working on a corp recruitment program and he's looking for people who are having tr trouble with corporation outreach it'll be this may apply to you and if yes. you're interesting interested to contact him with more detail i will find his actual discord name but he's also he is in the tis discord so if folks need him there or if you're already there i think you can do a summation point discord and twitch chat and you should come up but he's gonna set up a program for folks to help with corporate corporate yeah corporate outreach corporation outreach that sounds really weird corporate outreach but mostly for recruitment is what was what i'm trying to say so I posted his Discord and Twitch chat for those who, who need to get a hold of him. But check him out. We will probably be doing more, talking with him about about his project. We'll we'll see more, but he's getting it started. 
And then I'm gonna let I'm gonna do final thoughts. I'll do that with LB. Do you want to start? Whoa, that's a lot of pressure. Final thoughts? <laughs> I don't know. I'm streaming this week, so I'm, I'm gonna run the uh, the hunt on Monday, and we'll see what happens. Probably lose a hawk or two, so come join us on that. Wrong is recruiting. Uh, you can find us on Twitter, Discord, anywhere that there's social media. We should be there somewhere. That's all I got. Alrighty, and then Ash. Yeah, COE's recruiting, but no, mostly the things I recommend everybody keep an eye on from news is the Ugidi constellation and Ugali system. I don't know what's going to come out of the Ugali system yet. That we probably won't see that when it's ready to kick, until it's ready to kick off. But uh, Fortress of Set has been on fire. If you're at all interested in in you know just constant conflict or that kind of stuff. The Amar militia and the Mimitar militia have been duking it out over Flosis and the set for quite some time. So, and, you know, the entire Yugiti constellation. And, uh, you know, so they, they continue to push back and forth on that. And the universe characters, uh, specifically like Sorum, has been massing a huge amount of forces in that area. So, I expect that as we go into FanFest and whatever, you know, we're on the brink of war. And whatever is going to spark this off is likely going to come from a set or Yugali's. Yeah, it's worth pointing out. So that's a good call out, Ash, because a couple of weeks ago we had Arcia and a couple of uh, Faction Warfare folks from both sides of the war talking about it. So this is kind of like the lead up from what we were talking from there. Yeah, it's definitely definitely going forward <laughs> always action out there in, in faction warfare all right so with that we're gonna close today's episode i would ask artemis if he had any final thoughts but he is muted to you all so we're gonna pretend he said something really great and thought thought provoking wow but artemis that's profound yeah good point artemis that's well, solid well, man i wish i wish we had said that earlier like undermines like half the things i said <laughs> so new point of view so thank you, Elvi, and thank you, Asherathi, for joining me today. And thank you all in chat. I appreciate your comments and thoughts. With that, we're going to end today's Talking in Stations. Have, we will, next week is Easter, but I will be around. But if we have crew missing, we may call it because of the U.S. holiday. But for the most part, we'll plan to be there. But thank you all. I hope you have a good evening.